Hi everyone and welcome to this Lunch and Learn. Uh, my name is Sofia Lovstrand and I am a project manager at uh, Dry Sweden and this is my colleague Martin. Hi, I'm Martin. I'm a project manager in communications at AI Sweden and this Lunch and Learn is a joint event between our organizations, AI Sweden and Drive Sweden. And uh, before uh, we get started with today's presentations, uh, I would like to remind you to uh, mute your microphones and uh, uh, stop your, your cameras. Um, perfect. Uh, so this Lunch and Learn uh, is about AI and visualization <coughs> for research and business intelligence. And uh, uh, with us today, to present about uh, a, a, pro a project on this is uh, Gustav Nelhans and Johan Eklund from uh, Högskolan i Borås Data as Impact Lab. And they will be here in uh, just a few seconds. So uh, before we hand over to them, uh, I just want to uh, explain a little bit about the background of why we are here together today. And uh, it's due to a um, quite interesting project we did with the Swedish traffic traffic administration, uh, where we, we uh, at Dry Sweden and AI Sweden did a pre-study on how to uh, use AI more in the planning of the transport system. Uh, and in that work, uh, we did a lot of, of uh, um, search of information. We did interviews, workshops, we looked at uh, news paper articles or uh, internet paper articles, and also um, um, scientific publications and kind of drowning in all the information that's available out there. So uh, as an example for the newspaper articles, we used a program called uh, Retriever to search and find a lot of interesting stuff. But from 4,000 4, articles, we found 59 that were really interesting for our case. So when we came to the scientific part, we, we kind of had too much already and we needed the help uh, from some experts. So uh, to present today, uh, Gustav and Johan will talk a little bit more about what they did in, in the project that we did together and also what the potential is uh, for these methods in, in other areas. So please, uh, Gustav and Johan, uh, take the stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting us here to talk to you today. Uh, uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, what we did in the project, but mainly we will try to talk a little bit more about what we can use these technologies that, that we work with, rather than actually giving the, the uh, contents of the report, because that report and the, the methods are described there. But you will, if you have read it or seen it, you will see uh, that you, uh, some of the things that we talk about today will also be found there. Well, uh, we come from uh, Library and Information Science, which is a, a research area in the University of Boros, and we study information in different ways. And I study specifically bibliometrics, which is uh, the statistical analysis of uh, scientific articles, one could say, uh, with a specific focus on citations. I will come back to that in a minute. And Johan mainly works with text in various ways and information retrieval. And we have tried to, within this lab that we have started, we have tried to combine these two uh, pieces of, of uh, theory and, and ways of working with, with research to create uh, something that is quite new. There are others that are working on it internationally, but we are, are going to international conferences and presenting our things as uh, interesting things that are, are found at these conferences. Well, uh, so I will start just to say something about uh, bibliometrics and, and specifically the citation, because the citation is very important in the work that we do here, because we try to combine uh, the references that become citations in the citation index and text in our analysis. Uh, going back uh, 50 or 70 years maybe, uh, the, the citation in, uh, index as an ID was created by Eugene Garfield, who, who saw that we need a way to identify uh, 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 empirically how history has developed within, within research. And he, he had an idea that by following references, we could follow the history backward and forward in time to, uh, to understand how research has developed because the, the publication is so important. Uh, 
the background of this is, of course, that that uh, uh, philosopher of science has an idea, or, or maybe a theory of science, that the, the text is, is the final output of, of all research in, in various ways. Of course, we use models and we create them and so on, but they are always communicated through texts uh, which are published. And uh, the so-called scientific norm system says that uh, research should be open, openly available to everyone. It should be communal or even communistic. It should be universal, meaning everyone should be able to uh, have, have the right to do research. It, it shouldn't be close to any, anyone from any uh, social level or, or ethnic uh, uh, background or uh, gender or, or whatever. Uh, the researcher should be disinterested, not taking claims uh, as personal, but being uh, uh, open to, to change when new uh, results come out. And most spe specifically for the work with bibliometrics, the organized skepticism, which is institutionalized in the peer review system, is a very, very important uh, thing. And Robert Martin was a sociologist of science who wrote about this in, in the mid-1900s. And uh, uh, one of his books, uh, On the Shoulders of Giants, uh, uses um, a, a quote from uh, 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 Newton saying, if I have seen further, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And the idea of using references as a way of, of looking into history uh, is built on this quote in a way, or this quote illustrates this in a very good way. So uh, in the 60s, uh, another historian of science, Director Sola Price, uh, came up with the idea that we can look at the network of scientific papers uh, and we can look at, at them almost as, a, as a, a genealogy. So you follow a family tree in a way. And to the right, I have something that I did uh, maybe a couple of years ago, uh, where you can see that we follow uh, from history, from, from the top and down to, uh, to today, so to speak, at the bottom. And uh, just looking at each uh, article in this case, each node is an article here, it, it gets very blurry very quickly. So instead, we, we, in bibliometrics, there have been developed different ways of working with aggregating the data. In this case, I show in a way that the co-citation the, the, is the intellectual base of the research. Articles that are often cited together also uh, forms some kind of intellectual base that we stand on or look backwards to. And on the other hand, right now, what is published right now could be talked about as the research front. And looking then at which articles, which researchers, or which journals are right now um, publishing research in this area that we are looking at, we can see it as, as uh, that, that we are trying to identify these research fronts. In a way, we can see this as a space-time model or something like that, where we go from history and forward to the future. In practice, then, this could look like this. Uh, this is, is uh, uh, material that, that we used in, in the, the presentation, where we looked at the background. Who, wh where is the history of, of the research uh, when it came to um, uh, uh, air quality research? And we looked at air quality in relation to artificial intelligence. And by looking at these different clusters, we could find different historical paths, so to speak, where, from where the research came. These are the articles that are often cited in the material that we identified, or the, the, the data set that we, the, we created. On the other hand, we could look into the future. And this is data from a, a completely different data set, but it is on Scientometrics, the field that we are working on here. And Scientometrics, that journal, in this case, these, these are journals, that is, of course, central to the field of Scientometrics. But we can also see to the right that a lot of people working in physics are very interested in working with network models and looking at the research. And to the left, we see the traditional library and information science researchers. So in a way, we can see that there are different uh, groups working on bibliometrics just by looking at this picture. Lastly, uh, when it comes to bibliometrics, we can look at, at uh, words. And in this case, we use something that we call co-word analysis. Words that often occur together are related to each other. And this is, again, from the traffic safety part of the, the, the study that we did. And for example, we could show that when uh, uh, the, the uh, conv convolutional neural networks were used, uh, uh, that, that, those, that technology was used, or that AI technology was used mostly on computer vision, 
uh, feature extraction and uh, um, image analysis in a way. While when we looked at uh, the, the model log logistic regression, we could find that in our data set, GIS and geography was the area where, or, or maybe environmental research was the area where logistic re regression, that uh, technique was used. Lastly, when uh, reinforcement learning was, was used as a method that was linked to autonomous vehicles, for example, Internet of Things and so on. Just an example for what we can work with this. So we have, we have a, what we can call a, a, a research program in our research where we combine texts and uh, uh, references or citation data into what we call them. Uh, uh, well, we talk about the, this then. We, we use references as if they were words in our analysis. So when there is a reference, we, we uh, uh, for example, we, we can change that and say that this is a word, whatever word that is. The point is that we can look at which words are used, for example, when a specific references, uh, a reference is cited. And uh, this could look like this. This is a, a text that we have worked with. This is from medical research, not from exactly the project that we worked on here. But first of all, we can see which article cites which one, uh, these numbers at the top. And then we see 20 words, the reference uh, ID, and then 20 words again. Uh, and and these, these are then extracted from the, the full text, the text of, of the material. And what we can do then is to create, for example, uh, a model of how, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, terrorism is mentioned when researchers talk about uh, um, uh, uh, this is in medical research in a specific data set, quite broad data set. When, when ter terrorism is talked about, these are the areas that are found. And the point here, which is not so easy to see in this uh, uh, image, but you can so sometimes see numbers. And these are IDs from PubMed, uh, 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 publication database. And these are intermingled with words. And for example, the, the number, the ID that starts with 15 and ends, ends with 83, this is this specific article on mental health, social functioning and disability in post-war Afghanistan uh, soldiers. And we can see when we look at, at the map that when th that uh, article is cited, researchers use the terms war, Iraq, humanitarian, asylum, seekers, and so on. So we, we can see that uh, just by looking at this, we can see that there is some resemblance of, of likeness just by, by looking at this map. Of course, we can also measure this, how close we, we come. Here's another article, which uh, is about bicycle commute, commuter safety rates. And when that article is cited in the material that we look at here, they mention crashes, motorcycles, pedestrians, which of course are quite close to the, the interest of, of of uh, traffic in, in different ways, and so on. Here's one about conspiracy uh, theories, which is in the psychological uh, topic, so to speak. And lastly, we have one article on bullying, uh, on cyberbullying, and that is uh, directly between the words bullying and cyberbullying. When those words are used, and other words that you see around it here, that article is mentioned. So by using this, we can combine references, how research is, is uh, used, with the content of, of the actual research that, that is done. And that is one way that we can work with these materials. Now I would like to leave the words to Johan. Let's see. Yes. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Johan Eklund, senior lecturer at Skolen in Borås, focusing on text mining and the use of artificial intelligence for extracting information from text and classifying texts and also modeling language so I'm going to say a few words about how we have used artificial intelligence in this product, uh, this recent product, but also the potential for AI in text mining in particular. So a lot is said about artificial intelligence these days. Uh, we, we can encounter it often as a marketing uh, term uh, to highlight that this product is using modern technology. And what is then AI really? Uh, and to put it briefly, one can say that whenever we talk about artificial intelligence, we refer to something that appears to have a human-like behavior or perception and also understanding. 
uh, something that can solve a problem resembling human intelligence. But the large uh, research area within AI is called machine learning, which refers to different techniques for uh, creating systems that can learn from different kinds of data and different situations to solve various problems. For instance, to uh, classify uh, a collection of texts or classify a collection of images uh, in order to use them, for instance, in autonomous vehicles. Within machine learning, we find an area that has uh, received a lot of attention in, in later years called deep learning, which is, one could say, one possible way to uh, perform machine learning using so-called neural networks, and where one could say that the architecture created to perform machine learning has a greater complexity than traditional machine learning. And this is something I'm going to say a few words about. So when we talk about traditional machine learning, we refer to processes where the researcher has to be involved to a large extent by, for instance, uh, providing uh, good representations of the items that are supposed to be learned, for instance, for classification. So that means that the researchers also have to have a lot of knowledge about the the objects or, or the material that they are going to apply the different AI algorithms for. Whereas deep learning refers to processes where we stack different learning layers uh, in a sequence so that these systems can also learn the representations themselves. And this particular branch has then become very popular and successful for various uh, tasks like, for instance, image uh, classification and, and computer vision. So this is an example of uh, deep learning in action uh, using a so-called convolutional neural network that Gustav mentioned, uh, where we can see the different uh, layers in the uh, learning process. And these are meant to resemble the architecture or the structure of the human brain. And each layer will learn a different level of abstraction in the images. So it, it, it's a process from the single pixels up to uh, more abstract motifs, for instance, uh, the car brand in this case. And uh, this has become a success story when it refers to uh, image classification and computer vision. But in uh, recent years, we can also say that these new learning methods have been successfully applied to language and text analysis. And this is what I'm going to talk about in, in particular now. So what then do we mean by when we talk about text and what is the problem involved when we want to analyze a large uh, collection of uh, texts of various kinds? And I want to introduce this image. I guess there are other uh, similar images as well that we can think of text as we do about trains, namely that text basically is a sequence of words, just like a train is a sequence of cars. And they are connected in a specific way, which we also think of in language, we call it syntax, how to construct sentences from single words. And each car in a train carries a particular kind of content. And this also, um, resembles how we view uh, words in language uh, carrying different uh, meanings, uh, what we call the semantics of the words in language. In the early models of uh, machine learning as well as uh, so-called information retrieval, the representations of the text themselves were quite uh, simple, even primitive. Uh, often using something called bag of words models, meaning that the texts before being analyzed and, for instance, classified by the system, were um, split into the words that uh, the text consisted of, so that the text were transformed into what we could call bags or collections of words, disconnected from their original context. And one might wonder how this could work at all, that we could just extract the words, put them in, for instance, alphabetic order, and use that as a representation of the text themselves. But it has worked to a certain extent, but of course we lose 
also a lot of information using such approaches. But this is an approach still used, and in the early days of uh, machine learning, it, it was the, what I could call the dominant model. But in recent decades, one has started to think more about how language really is structured. Uh, for instance, when it comes to relations between words. So it is not the case in reality that words are isolated islands or phenomena, but rather form different semantic groups and uh, networks. And this information gets lost in a very simple primitive model like the bag of words models. So in recent cases, it has become more and more popular to try to capture information about semantic relations using models from, for instance, geometry, creating so-called word spaces. So we utilize vehicles like vectors, for instance, which can capture also the um, relationships that appear when words are used together in different ways. So we can find words um, appearing in the same context and perhaps even in the same sentences following each other. And this can be captured in different statistical models and these statistical models can then be also utilized in the systems performing, for instance, text uh, categorization. And this is an example of a visualization of such a word space and the idea is that words being close to each other in this uh, illustration are also be believed to be semantically close to each other. And this is something that is uh, identified by their use uh, and the co-occurrence in uh, paragraphs and sentences, for instance. And uh, one of the methods we have used in uh, this recent project is, uh, one could say, a modern extension of that idea to create representations of words such that uh, words can be mapped into a space where the geometric similarity between these uh, representations also correspond to their semantic relations and similarities in um, language use. And Google Research has developed several um, very uh, popular and effective such language models, of which one is called Universal Sentence Encoder, where the basic idea is to first create semantic representations of the single words in language, and then create representations on sentence level so that we can capture what does a sentence mean uh, composed by a sequence of words. And this universal sentence encoder utilizes a deep learning method called deep averaging network to first create a kind of semantic average of the words in the sentences and then train on those averages. And we have used this as a kind of fishing rod or fishing tool to find uh, interesting paragraphs and even sentences in the text that, have, that we have been working with. So we have started with a reference phrase, which we can regard as a kind of query. And then using these uh, sentence representations, we have tried to identify sentences within the scientific text that share a uh, lot of uh, similarities with this uh, reference sentence. So they have a high semantic similarity, one could say. And we can see some of the sentences that were identified as the most similar ones. And the diagrams to the right illustrates uh, the sequence of sentences within the text and the semantic similarities. We can see that there are some peaks here and, here and there, and those are referring to the most interesting sentences. So this is an example of how we can use modern languages, language modeling, as well as uh, deep learning to also successfully work with uh, text retrieval. Another kind of idea that has become very uh, successful in recent years is called attention mechanism. Namely that when the, these computer systems are supposed to learn uh, semantic relations between words, that cannot be performed just on a word level, but we also need to look at words in their particular contexts. 
And this um, idea called attention means that when we want to uh, identify what a word means, for instance, before it is translated into another language, the system should learn what other words in the context it should pay special attention to when trying to understand what this particular word means. So not every word in the previous context has the same importance. And therefore, the system needs to learn which words to pay certain attention to. And this idea has been in captured in recent language models of which this one mentioned here called BERT is perhaps the most popular and uh, I would say also famous one in the research community. It's also a product from Google Research. And uh, basically it's trained on learning uh, so-called masked models. Namely, if we exclude certain words from the text, which words have been excluded? So the system is supposed to learn uh, which words that are missing in the text and by doing so, it learns a lot about contextual information. It can also learn uh, how to predict which, uh, if a certain sentence is uh, probable to follow another sentence or not. Using this kind of training methodology, uh, Google Research has managed to develop uh, language models that, especially this uh, model called BERT, that um, offers a performance on various language tests or linguistic tests that uh, is superior to anything we have seen so far. And uh, in this text, we can see that there are different tasks that are supposed to be performed. For instance, uh, to study the so-called sentiment in texts and predict what kind of uh, emotions are expressed in this particular text called sentiment analysis. Uh, or another problem could be, is this sentence a paraphrase of another sentence? So it's basically a rewording of uh, another sentence, for instance, the previous sentence. Uh, does this sentence contradict the previous sentence or does it agree with it? So we can even introduce some kind of logical inference using these uh, most modern uh, language models. And another problem areas to create systems for answering particular questions. So one problem that we have applied these modern language models like BERT to is called named entity recognition, which refers to processes where the system is supposed to identify names of things, for instance, names of persons, names of locations, names of time points, and so on and uh, mark these in the text so that we can extract them from the text labeled as, for instance, a person name, uh, a geographic name, and so on, and also connect them together to form machine readable uh, facts about things which often include named entities. Another method that we have used a lot in this product, recent product with AI Sweden is, is called question answering. And this is one of the problem areas that I personally foresee will uh, receive much more attention in the upcoming years. Using question answering, the problem is to identify the sections in a collection of text that contain or are probable to contain the specific answers to specific questions. Like, for instance, in this text, we can find the answer, where is the headquarter of Google? It's somewhere in the text, but it's not expressed exactly using those words. But still, we can infer using question answering methods that the answers are probable to be right there in the text. And for this product that we have been a part of, we have trained uh, a system to use uh, or to identify uh, answers in scientific texts. And therefore, we also have used models based on scientific articles. So these are language models that have been trained on a large collection of scientific articles and therefore are well acquainted with scientific language. 
And we can see some examples of questions that we have asked to the abstracts that we have analyzed. For instance, what methods are used to measure and analyze traffic flows in the road traffic network? And here are some suggested answers extracted directly from the abstracts. Another question has been what measurements methods and types of data sources are used to map and analyze air quality? And again, we can see some phrases extracted from the abstracts that are believed to be answers to these questions. And also, which I'm going to uh, say uh, as the final words here, is the use of text summarization, which is a somewhat forgotten or neglected use of uh, text analysis, namely to try to capture the overall content of a text by summarizing it in just a few sentences. And to this end, we have also used these recent deep learning based language models. And these are some examples of short, we can call them abstracts, that have been generated. And the principle here is that these uh, sentences are not only extracted from the text, but they are generated by the language models. So this involves some kind of language understanding. And just to get a, a brief understanding of, or, or a quick understanding of the text, having access to such very short abstracts could be also very valuable to the researchers trying to get acquainted with, for instance, a new research field. So that was, I think we, Yes, I think we are perfectly in time, if I understand it. So what I just wanted to uh, end this part of, of the seminar is to just say a, a few words about yeah, the, the program that I talked about before. Combining bibliometrics or scientometrics with text analysis, specifically semantic analysis, but other kinds of text analysis is also possible. There are uh, a broad uh, group of things that we could work with. Uh, generally, bibliometrics is used for evaluating research, where it's often known in that way, or for measuring, uh, is my research good enough? Uh, am I ready to be a docent in Sweden, for example, or uh, can I get, get the job in front of somebody else? But what we want have shown here is that bibliometrics or science metrics has so many more uh, uses and can be used together uh, very uh, forcefully when you use text analysis and um, these uh, citation analysis te techniques together. Uh, and these are just some of, of the materials that we have worked with or, or ideas that we, we talk about explorative scientometrics instead of um, evaluative uh, scientometrics. We use question answering as a technique, for example, but many others also. Uh, we look at the context of references or, or of the citation in the texts, and by that being able to combine how research is used, not just what what is said within the research. And lastly, we have in other projects extended this to look at other uh, areas of research uh, impact, so to speak. Uh, one that is very well known, I haven't written it here, but you often talk about altmetrics, measuring how many tweets or how many Facebook uh, uh, posts that, that have been uh, put up uh, that cites this research. But again, you miss so much information when you just count the, the, the instances. It's much more interesting to look at the content. And professional impact is, for example, in, in medical research, looking into clinical guidelines, which clinical guidelines and, and what is the content of the guidelines that cite the research that is done in, in academia. So again, using these techniques, we can follow uh, uh, the material in different ways. And just to, to uh, I just can, um, remembered one thing that I want to mention also, that for example, the technique that is used by Google in uh, the Google search engine, the PageRank algorithm, is directly a derivative of scientometric research and studies that were done in the 1970s in scientometrics that then became the, the basis of the whole idea of using uh, bibliometric uh, or using uh, uh, links as a way of, of evaluating search results in, in Google. So that is an example of how forceful these techniques are. So with that, I want to end my presentation here and give the word again back to Sophia and Philip. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, both uh, Gustav Johan for your presentations. Um, could say that uh, uh, 
without understanding everything that you said, I can certainly understand how we can use your uh, competence and your knowledge. Uh, we have uh, had a, um, a very good collaboration and uh, using the, this all this science to, to extract information in our case. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wanted to start with a question about uh, just that, because we were looking at, uh, you, Gustav, you were kind of helping us to, with the bibliometric science yes. of finding uh, what could be interesting out there when it comes to uh, scientific publications. And then the next step was, as I see it more, you wanna, how do we search for what is the absolute most, most interesting in that, in that uh, space? Yeah. Uh, so we use it for scientific publications, but could we use the same methods for other uh, sources of information for newspaper articles or even social media? Mm. Um, is it just to copy and paste or how, how could you well, work on it? Yes, to a certain extent it, it is. But of course, uh, Biometrics has these uh, established databases that we work with and, and uh, they help us getting the data in, in a tidy format that is uh, easier to work with. But extracting information even from PDFs is possible, but not so fun to work with uh, always. But then you can use different um, uh, ways of categorizing the information, for example, the meta information about who is the author, uh, from what, what lab or from what uh, organization does this text come from. So in a way, uh, it can be used in, in, in these ways. And the, the whole of the web is based on the idea of linking and uh, uh, presenting text. So in that way, links are there and the links work a little bit as uh, references uh, within uh, the internet. So in that, in that case, yes, it is possible uh, in many different ways.